We were looking at the problem of overloading amplifier inputs. And if you recall, I made a test CD which contained a number of um, um, tones of, of varying uh, loudness. And on track three, the final tone produces a fully modulated output signal from the CD player, which is typically around about 2, 2.1 volts. And when that's coupled to a normal high sensitivity amplifier input, clipping uh, occurs. The amplifier simply can't amplify what is already a very large signal. So if we just remind ourselves where we got to, um, here again is the digital scope that's connected across the output and we're using a tone so you'll see a, a sine wave displayed on here. It's just so much easier to use a sine wave than, than music um, because music, the waveform dances around whereas this is quite stable. So I've set the amplifier volume back to um, the point at which it uh, was just about clipping. We'll prove that by playing the um, highest level tone, that's tone E on this uh, CD that we made. The next level is very loud. This is tone E. Tone E represents the maximum recordable level on a CD and in these examples it represents a typical 2.1 volts RMS output. This tone is extremely loud and could damage your equipment. Please start with a reduced volume setting and increase the volume during the playing of the tone until distortion is detectable. If there is no distortion detectable, your equipment is capable of handling this very loud peak signal from the output of your CD player. You can hear the clipping distortion. It's barely visible on the screen, but... So that's our... That's our absolute maximum level from the CD player without obvious distortion, and that equates to a uh, setting of 3, which is roughly the um, control pointing in a sort of 10 o'clock direction. Now, if we take the um, output from the CD player, which is this phono lead here, perfectly standard um, red and white phono lead, and we connect it to um, these inline attenuators so that we plug the signal from the um, CD player into one end. We'll do that for both channels. So we've connected these uh, inline attenuators. And then we plug those into the back of the amplifier into the same input. And we wind back the CD. Let's find out how much further around the dial we can rotate the volume control uh, without the amplifier clipping. We've left the control set, the volume control set to 3, which was the absolute uh, highest setting that we could use when um, we had the unattenuated CD player playing directly into the amp. The um, CD player is now feeding via those two attenuators phono inline attenuators and let's see how much further we can turn the volume. Detectable. If there is no distortion detectable your equipment is capable of handling this very loud peak signal from the output of your CD player. Aha! So we can turn it up quite a lot. Oh, up there. So we're now able to rotate the volume control to more or less the midday position, 12 o'clock, and we've put the range of audio from the CD player into a much more usable and stable part of the volume control. If we uh, used more resistance in the attenuators, for example, we stacked them, we can only do this on one channel, so... Um, I'll show you what I mean. If we took, for example, the right channel, 
and we fed the signal through the first attenuator and then the second attenuator because I don't want to disassemble these and put different resistors in them. And we connect that to the uh, input of the amplifier and we run the CD back a bit. Loud peak signal from the output of your CD player. There we are, that's nearly three o'clock. So the volume control is now set for the same level output at nearly three o'clock. So by dropping the signal that comes out of the preamplifier, the uh, CD player into the preamplifier, into the amplifier, we've been able to move the peak uh, loudness from a setting of about 10 o'clock to nearly half a rotation further at about 3 o'clock. And that's simply due to dropping the signal coming in so the amplifier can be allowed to amplify more. And of course, that's what the volume control does. So, what's actually inside one of these attenuators? What's the magic? What's the working chemical? What's the, what's the, uh, the clue? Well, actually, I don't know if I can get this completely apart, but what gives you an idea, if I unscrew it, is there are two very small, there are two very small resistors in there, I don't know if that's in focus, inside the metal case. And they're joined together, one goes to ground, and one is the pass-through signal, and that pass-through then comes out at the other end on the plug. And the resistors, nothing more, I've measured them already. If I take the draw from my parts bin, all they are is completely standard resistors metal film, high quality, 1% uh, resistors, um, combined like this. So if this is the signal from the, this is the signal from the um, CD player, all in fact we have in the attenuator is one of the resistors is coupled to the pin of the incoming signal from the CD player. The other one is twisted together at the apex of that. So that's our second resistor. And that one is coupled to the metal case, the metal shield. And then we put another phono plug on the end of that and that goes into the amplifier. So it's completely inconceivable that there is any change in sound quality with this because the amplifier itself is stuffed full of hundreds of resistors and um, the mixing desk that made the recording likewise and uh, the CD player, uh, even the loudspeaker has resistors in it. So it's um, it's, it's beyond credibility that, the, that um, a couple of resistors can make that massive degradation of sound which uh, is alleged with um, inline attenuators. It is just nonsense. So there we are. We, if we rescale the signal from a CD player, either by turning the signal down inside the CD player, or dropping the signal on its way into the amplifier, or turning the signal down at the... Uh, earliest point in the amplifier circuit, we have a nice, clean, unclipped, um, distortion-free output. And that is the very definition of high fidelity. So there you have a brief run-through on inline attenuation.